We kunnen van start. Oké, hey. good evening. Good evening everybody here. It's a tiny audience uh, because most people are online. So most welcome to everybody online. Um, this session will be in English, mostly. One speaker will be in Dutch. Um, so let me first uh, announce where this webinar is about. It's about community-oriented primary care. And that concept will become clear as you will listen to the speakers. And I welcome the speakers, Fleur, Shakib, Majid, and Connie. Um, but I will announce them in more detail later. Uh, for many of you, this concept of community-oriented primary care may be rather new, but in public health, yes, even in research and interventions in community, the search for effective community interventions is hot and new. A friend of mine told me she's doing intervention in 11 communities in Pemba yes. Island, north of Zanzibar, each community with a slightly different intervention in an ecological project to see what is most effective. And some weeks ago in Romania, I saw a project in a community with a high stroke prevalence and myocardial inf infarctions, where they tried to involve the community in reducing risk that is that from smoking to less meat and salt. It's hot and it is fascinating. So I keep this introduction to this and I will ask Fleur now to come to the floor and do her presentation. But maybe uh, I will announce already now that there will be more webinars coming at the 19th of October and the 2nd of November on tropical infectious diseases and dermatology on dark skin. Also very interesting, free accredited webinars. So please um, join these webinars. You will be most welcome. Okay, Fleur. I can first introduce you, Fleur, maybe you stand up, stand next to me, because she is an assistant professor of family medicine in Nairobi at this age already, and presently working in Gansenhoef, Amsterdam, just around the corner. And she worked as a street doctor for the Paulus Church in Rotterdam. But her magnus opus, her great job is the family medicine training electives in community-oriented primary care in, in Kenya. I witnessed that three weeks as a trainer and I was impressed by that program. So the floor is to you, Fleur. I'm very curious what you're going to say. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, and yes, Peter did help me uh, with setting up that whole COPC program. COPC is the abbreviation for community-ordered primary care. So uh, because it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and I'll tell you, I, I hope to tell you a little bit about that uh, in the next uh, few minutes. It's all about communities this evening. We're actually in a community building where a lot of cultural events it's are uh, being organized for the community of Amsterdam in Zuidoost. Um, small community here, bigger community online. Uh, and the goals for this evening are to enhance your uh, knowledge on, uh, or your understanding actually on COPC. Uh, and I hope you can learn from best practices. I'll tell you something about how we set it up in, in Kenya, uh, but you'll learn from the London experience. I was um, able to meet uh, Cornelia, um, who you'll uh, who will present later on in London last week. I was quite impressed by what she did. I was able to meet uh, Majid, who will present later about her practice in Amsterdam, also impressed by it. Uh, and same for uh, Shakib. Who, who we all know in the Netherlands, actually, for his uh, community uh, approach to medicine. Um, and I'll tell you a little about a bit, and that's my background. I have a, uh, uh, I'm a GP um, who works and lived in Africa for a long time, but I also have a medical education background. I did a master in medical education. And I think um, uh, it's essential that we change our approach to medical education for that the uh, GPs of the future, the doctors of the future, uh, are able to provide community primary care. So I'll tell you a little bit about the global forces and the future of health um, and why uh, I think that should lead to community or to primary care. I'm not the only one. It's, it's, it's a bit of a global movement. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the critical competencies for medical education. 
So when I first um, arrived in South Africa in 2008, I lived and worked there um, for two years in a state hospital um, in Durban. Um, it was the first time that I was confronted with determinants of health. It might be a, a known term to you, but it was something that, that was new to me. I was never taught about it in undergraduate education, nor did I learn about it um, during my uh, training as a GP. And I thought that was quite astonishing because uh, the determinants of health and the social determinants of health, so the way we, uh, we are housed, uh, whether we have access to water, uh, our, our living conditions, uh, education, income, are so important for our ability uh, to stay healthy and to, to maintain health and also uh, to recover from health. So it's kind of weird that, at least in the Netherlands, we seem to think that this is a concept that is only uh, important if you um, are trained in international health, because in the Holland, we've uh, kind of divided public health from clinical care, and as doctors and nurses, we're trained in, uh, in clinical care competencies, but not so much about these determinants of health. Um, also, when I was in Durban, I learned uh, about uh, Sydney Clark, uh, which was the, actually the found, founder of uh, CUPC. Um, he, with his wife, came to Folela, which is a, a poor community in Durban in the 1940s, and he saw um, that his community was getting um, uh, more ill. So he provided the best care possible uh, with his wife in the clinic. But uh, this is uh, in the middle of apartheid. So um, what happened, the man moved to Johannesburg to work in the mines. Uh, the women and the children stayed behind. I uh, didn't know how to work on the land. Um, the men, when they came back from their work in the mines, they brought back uh, sexual transmitted diseases, HIV, and the whole community became uh, more ill, even though he was trying his utmost best in, in, um, in his clinic. So he then came up with this idea of CUPC, what, that he had to integrate frontline uh, clinical medicine with public health. Um, and this um, approach, uh, he was quite successful in it. He managed to decrease HIV TB in his community uh, quite well. It should be rooted in the community. So he worked, he was only there alone with his wife. So he worked together with the communities to make sure um, this care was provided for them and actually by them. Um, and this brings me a little bit to uh, the global forces and the future of health. So we used to, um, we used to be able to, so in the past, we focused on the social conditions of life, clean water, housing, those determinants of health that I was talking about, healthcare systems, so we invested in public health, and there were scientific advances, antibiotics, uh, vaccines, and we managed to increase our life expectancy. What the future holds for us, though, um, is a little bit different. We're not very likely to increase life expectancy that much. Yet there are global forces affecting Africa, affecting um, the Netherlands, the UK, um, that will um, probably lead to the fact that we are living longer, but with more disease, right? We have more chronic diseases. And this is because of uh, social conditions of life that are changing. So there's people are going to the cities, living on smaller spaces, um, away from their communities often, which leads to social isolation mental health issues, there's climate change, which uh, leads to forced migration. It's inevitable, um, although our politicians seem to think that we can maybe uh, prevent it, but uh, it's, it's going to happen, um, as we know. Lifestyle changes uh, are um, uh, happening, so people have not only poor diet, sedentary lifestyles, but definitely also inadequate sleep, which leads to a lot of stress, um, we have changing healthcare systems, so virtual care, but also, and we, it's a bit new, it's post-COVID, there's huge workforce shortage. So here in Amsterdam, and in Rotterdam, actually, in, in the Netherlands, and I heard it, heard it from Connie as well in the UK, uh, our GPs have uh, patient stops, right? We, we just don't have the capacity anymore to admit uh, more patients to our facility. Uh, so it's kind of similar for becoming more similar to the African situation uh, where this was um, always a problem. And there are scientific advances, precision medicine. Maybe we're able to prolong uh, life um, 
uh, but we are uh, in the future hopefully able to target individuals uh, based on uh, their DNA sequence. And I wanted to mention this because I think it's important because I think we, we should do the same for communities. And it's a term I want to bring in, uh, which is precision community medicine. And I'll talk about it a little bit later on. So a changing world uh, necessitates a community approach and also WONCA, which is the uh, international um, federation, I actually don't know how we call it, but like organization for general practitioners uh, also says, taking responsibility only for those who visit the practice is not sufficient. We need responsive, active and outreaching community approach. So we need to increase our focus on delivery of care uh, rather than just clinician skills. Uh, and another way to illustrate this um, is to look at this top of the iceberg. Um, and I like this saying, it was, um, it was a statement by Steve Reed, also one of the fun founders of COPC uh, in South Africa. He said, do you know that a physician can spend uh, his or her whole life seeing patients and treating them without making any difference? Uh, to the community around him or her. So a little bit what happened to Sydney Clark in, uh, in Folela. It's quite a depressing thought, but um, yeah, we need to be aware of that. Um, so on the left is this picture, again from Durban, where I lived so long. Um, on the left, a golf course, and on the right, this informal settlement. Rich and poor, but also differences in health diseases. It's not only uh, something that happens in the African situation on the right, and I'm aware that you can't really see it, but um, you see the different neighborhoods in Amsterdam and the dark um, dark areas where there's uh, is where there's a lot of obesity, and the lighter areas is where there's uh, um, um, very little obesity, and you can see that um, those neighborhoods lie right next to each other, right? You can uh, the ones with a with a higher uh, so with poor health, basically, if you um, talk about obesity, at least, uh, right, uh, lie right next to the ones with, uh, with better health. And this is why I think we need to be aware of that. And we need to um, approach communities more precisely based on the uh, problems that are uh, relevant in that community, right? We can't approach all communities in a similar way because they're different. So we need to know about the problems. And um, if we want to implement any, oh yeah, so this is this is a um, uh, the, the ultimate goal of a health system. So to improve patient experience, improve the health of a population, and ideally a decreased cost. And we have some data to show you that the examples that we uh, that will be given later on uh, by my colleagues actually lead to decreased cost, um, which is quite exciting. So COPC then. Um, after my South African experience, I went to, uh, we went back to the Netherlands, I was trained as a GP, and on then it. I went back to Kenya, I lived and worked there for eight years, um, I was able to uh, further develop the COPC training, and uh, with my medical education background, I became the, the program department, sorry, the, the program director of the family uh, medicine department in Nairobi. And we uh, focused on CUPC and also training our residents. So these are GPs in, in training. We, we called them residents on CUPC. And what we said um, to the principles, and they're similar to, to what Sydney Clark and what they um, done in other countries. Um, and I think I forgot to tell you, but on the, on the slide early on, you saw that this was not only contained to South Africa. CUPC moved to Israel, Canada, the US, so it's quite widely spread nowadays, uh, this concept. So um, what is important is that the care is provided to a defined population. In Kenya, we would literally draw a map of the households um, and it would be a, like a geographically clear which households uh, were part of our practice population. In the Netherlands and other countries, this is a little bit different. It's more the, the patients who have uh, submitted or subscribed to your clinic, right? So it's a defined population. You know who your patients are, but it's not. It's maybe a little bit different than geographic. What was important is that um, the care that we provided was evidence-based in the sense uh, 
uh, that we knew which health problems were most prevalent or most important, and I'll come back to that later on, in our community, right? So we knew, um, uh, and that, that was based on data, 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 and I'll tell you a little bit more about how we interpreted those data. Then what is very important in COPC that the community is involved. So it's with the community, for the community, um, and by the community, the care that we deliver. Um, and it's equitable and accessible for all. Let me take you through what we did in, um, in Kenya. And just a, just a word of uh, Sidney Karg again, uh, why he thought community engagement was so important. Uh, so he said, we need to explore what the community feels thinks and does about its health needs, since interventions need to be directed towards those aspects about which people can do much themselves. To be able to um, uh, change behaviors in people, you need to um, do that in a way that is uh, that makes sense to them, right? Okay, so a little bit more about this. This is from an article that we uh, published about um, one of the interventions that we did in Kenya. So what you see here is the how also the government of Kenya works with this principle of community-oriented primary care. We know there is workforce shortage, not a lot of doctors, not a lot of nurses. So we worked together with community health volunteers. Um, and 20 community health volunteers would, would see a total of 500 households once every month. And so if I calculate it correctly, I think it's one uh, uh, community health volunteer per 40 households, right? And they would see them monthly, these households, and talk about prevention, lifestyle, anything that was important at that moment. And they would also be the arms of the doctors, right? If the doctors thought these are problems you need to focus on, they would go to these households and discuss this, um, which was ideal because this is the cycle of COPC. Um, and it's like I said before, important that you are able to characterize your community. So you know the problems that are important in, in your community. You then prioritize based on those health problems. Uh, so which, which, which problems are most important? Uh, and then, and this is all next to the, apart from all the clinical care that you're providing, of course, in the clinics, um, you try to understand that problem in detail and try to do something about it. I'll give you an example. Our residents, um, and I hope you can see this. Well, at least you can see the, the, the top five of problems um, um, which are mentioned uh, above the picture. So our residents, they worked in uh, small dispensaries. Those are small little clinics. Uh, often uh, only a nurse uh, would be there, but our residents would come there um, uh, for a period of three months because we worked out of Nairobi actually, in a very rural area. Uh, and they would look at um, the, the patients that would visit the clinic and the top five problems that they would see uh, were upper respiratory tract infections, urinary tract infections, bilharzia and malaria. Now, other data. So when they looked at the mortality data in the county, they would say, well, people uh, mostly die, and this was all uh, from the age 15 to 50 years, uh, or 60 years, I believe. Um, they would die of maternal complications, road traffic accidents, pulmonary tuberculosis, HIV-related deaths, and stroke. Very different um, problems, right, if you compare them to the dispensary data. And then if you would ask the community, so they would go into the community, uh, and sit with the community under a tree in this case. Obviously, also community health workers can do this. Um, what they would find important was malaria. Many of their kids died from malaria. Skin conditions. Um, skin conditions cause huge stigma. So they, um, when, when their kids have skin conditions, they don't send them to school because everybody uh, thinks that they're going to spread the disease, right? So it's of huge importance to them lack of drugs at the health facilities. And this was interesting because we um, understood that this is actually why people came to the, our dispensaries for upper respiratory tract infections, is because the dispensaries did have antibiotics uh, for those viral infections. We all know we shouldn't be given uh, antibiotics to viruses, uh, but this is 
why the patients came to the clinics and the, and the little dispensaries did not have much um, a treatment for the other problems. Um, so this was an interesting finding as well. Water scars, so they didn't have much access to water and then eye conditions was something that they found very important as well. Because eye conditions, poor vision had a huge impact on their health, right? For them, more important than people dying from road traffic accidents. At least they didn't mention it in the group discussion. Um, so how do you make sense of all these data? And this is what um, uh, we taught our residents, and they do a, a very similar thing in South Africa. We work together with South Africa a lot. Um, so we identified and prioritized those health problems based on these five criteria. So we said, let's look at how common is the health problem. So we look at the, the prevalence. How serious is it? Uh, this is measured by the case fatality rate. To what extent is the community concerned about it? I just talked about that. Is it feasible to intervene? And will an intervention be effective? So those five criteria, and we would rank them. And you can do this with numbers, or you can do it with, so for each of those, those criteria, uh, first we would have a list of problems. Uh, and I have a list of five here, but you can do like 10 problems. Uh, and we would rank them based on this criteria. And then the top one or two, three diagnoses uh, would be the ones that you that are most relevant, um, so not prevalent, but relevant in that community to intervene on. And I'll give you an example of the URTIs. Um, our residents chose that. So after a prioritization process, uh, they chose, uh, they discussed together with the community again and to, together with the health care team providing care to the community. They said URTIs are important because people are visiting our clinics for that. They're getting antibiotics, which um, leads to resistance. Our clinics are swamped with all these people who actually shouldn't be there. Um, and it's very easy to intervene. So they ranked high on those five criteria uh, and they implemented uh, intervention together with the community health workers to teach people uh, why they, uh, you know, which symptoms would be alarming uh, and when they should come to the clinics and when they should not come to the clinics. So we de developed. Uh, interventions that were um, yeah, based on problems of high priority uh, and were also most feasible with the resources available. And of course, uh, together with the community. So here's some examples. And I'll, of course, in that cycle that I just showed you, you need to evaluate what you're doing, whether that's um, helpful. And this was another publication um, where we were able to show that the, the example of the URTIs, this was actually together with Peter, wasn't it? I think so, yeah. Um, we were able to decrease, so we did several measurements. In the cycle, I said you need to evaluate, but then reassess. So we were able to decrease unnecessary prescription of antibiotics in the clinics. We were able to decrease unnecessary visits to the dispensary, actually uh, lowering the workload for uh, the nurses and the doctors, uh, um, because there was increased community awareness that people, you know, you shouldn't come to the clinics with, with a virus. What was also interesting is after a while, that uh, success was not so obvious anymore. You see that in the graphic, right? Uh, it goes up again. So you need to repeat it. <laughs> that was something that was, we were quite enthusiastic in the beginning, but uh, you need to repeat that training. What we also saw, there was more satisfaction under uh, family physician doctors, more satisfaction working within that primary healthcare team, uh, and more satisfaction amongst the patients. Uh, the project's a little bit too young to be able to show a difference in costs, um, but I'm quite happy that my colleagues, uh, at least some of them, are able to show you some differences. So why community medicine? Uh, well, I talked about that earlier on, but um, in a nutshell, a health equity to so reach those that really need it through precise community medicine, decrease the burden of preventable disease, uh, and also because of our shortage of GPs. Um, if we think about the European context, um, I think what we can learn from the African situation is that we should audits, audits, audits. The figures compel us, so we need to improve our data quality um, to be able to provide precision care. Uh, it needs to be co-designed, co-delivered, multidisciplinary in the communities, 
Um, and it would be great if we can make use of peer advocates and role models um, for shared decision making. Um, and one last slide, because I'm a bit of an education, but I think education is very important uh, for the future. Um, we need to refocus our medical education. So what we're, what we're doing now is we're focusing on care provided to an individual patient. And in our GP training in the Netherlands, at least, we're already very uh, focusing on, on these social uh, causes of ill health, right? So that's uh, something that we do well. But there's so many other elements um, that we need to train um, residents on. One of them is healthcare uh, data, right? How can we provide medicine based on um, uh, data that we should be gathering in our clinics? How do we, how do we um, interpret all those data that we have from the clinics? Because our systems provide a lot of data, but how do we make sense? And how do we provide proactive care based on those data instead of um, waiting until the problems reach us, right? Um, and other elements, leadership, uh, population health. Um, what's that? I, can't, I can't read my own slide. Teamwork, all those elements that are of huge importance uh, to make sure that our future doctors are able to provide, um, provide care to community. So take home message. Um, the community oriented practitioner understands the unique characteristics of the community that he or she serves and manages a population at risk. Remember the, 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 um, the area under the top of the iceberg, not just who, those who come, impacts those who are affected by the same conditions that lead to a primary consultation, uh, interprets data, knows and acts on the highest priorities for the health of that population, works in teams with others on health systems, uh, to promote access to care for vulnerable groups. Um, and that was it. This is actually uh, already the next uh, the next presenter. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Obviously, we now need to think, and that's why I thought it would be interesting to start with the African uh, example and then go to the, the Europeans ones. We need to think how this CUPC that was rooted in Africa uh, can now be implemented in um, in Europe, because it's obviously going to be different. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Christopher. OK. Now, this was a broad and fantastic overview of community-oriented primary care. And you made us enthusiastic about the whole concept. You see, it is mind-blowing if you think about how differently you can approach the whole the whole thing. And it's actually amazing that it has strong roots in Africa, where you think that you couldn't learn anything from there. Uh, we think it's the opposite. I think many of our students should go there to look and see how it works there. It gives them a lot more perspective. It, it, fascinating. So maybe we have some questions first, and there may be some chats coming in, Martin. He, he, takes care of that, um, that you yeah. answer those questions. Is there a question in the view, the floor? I cover the microphone, so. Did you know? Okay. Yeah? Uh, no. Okay, <laughs> my name is Karen Sepnam. I'm a physiotherapist. Fleur, thank you very much for the nice presentation. I was wondering, you are working with community health workers, how was the, the sustainability? Because uh, do they get some allowances or is there a high turnover if you are working with the volunteer work in the community? Yeah. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right. Well, it's a very good question. Um, there is a very high turnover, yes, because uh, it, it, it differs actually which community you work in. In Kenya, they only got small allowances. Um, so as soon as they found another job, they would move uh, to this other job. Uh, so this was definitely a problem because you need to um, ideally work together with people um, who you um, can work for a long time, right? Because the people in the in the households at some point trust these community volunteers and then it's uh, not good if you move on. So that's definitely something that can improve. 
um, Aino and, and, and uh, Cornelia will talk about that later on, um, that, that allowance matters. Uh, and she has good experiences with uh, her London practice. Um, so yeah, for, for us, um, well, I think, what, what was the sec uh, second question? The allowances on them? Yeah, because there might be a high turnover when there yeah. is no allowances. Well, no, yeah, for, I think she has some love. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no, think? it's 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 a system that is that is uh, implemented by the government, and there's more than enough people who would like, uh, who also feel that they want to serve their communities. So there's always people who are interested to be a community health volunteer. Yes, and again, there were small allowances, and we worked in a community where there was no other way to. Uh, you know, have an income otherwise, and maybe some, um, if you had some land, uh, but otherwise this was a quite um, good way actually to have a little bit of an income. Yeah. Well, oh, it's very true that it is, that they should be rewarded for the results. So you need data that are good results and the government has to do that. I remember from the community workers, they liked the bicycle, that then they could visit twice as many people. So what, they didn't get a bicycle, which is not, that much. So I, I think it's it's a very good question. How do you make it sustainable? Peter. Um, the other Peter. Yeah. Let me say that in the most clubs in Africa you can buy amoxicillin, for instance. So I can imagine if they don't get the antibiotics with you, uh, they buy it or they've already taken it before they come. And they come because their own medication has failed. And then I would be very much interested if that behavior has changed and if you've been able to monitor monitor that as well. Yeah, no, that's a very uh, good question. Uh, we we work together, so we sat together with the pharmacies, especially after you came, actually, um, uh, to sit with them and also educate them about the relevance of not providing them antibiotics, uh, the, the patient's antibiotics. So we had discussions with them uh definitely and um, they came which is already uh something so the pharmacies came to our discussions uh, we weren't we didn't monitor uh that so it's a good question yeah yeah, yeah. because that the economy uh, or, or their finance is dependent on selling drugs yeah so it's that's uh, something to tackle i would suggest yeah Thank you. So I have a question. So you're uh, providing examples um, from from Kenya. Um, do you have any examples here in this neighborhood um, with with the GP practice that you're working for um, related to COPD? I, I think I'm going to leave that to Majid. She she um, works for a different practice, <clears throat> but she works with a system which is called Khartaga Basisorg, which is powerful basic care basically and we work in our practice we work with the same system um so she will provide she will be able to tell you a little bit more about that system okay one last question Mika, and then we proceed because we have three more people you know a bit uh, maybe the death for question how do you reach the population at risk because you did you got the data from the dispensaries uh, the health centers, the OPD. Yeah, so I, I should have said it. So this was just a small uh, example. I just chose one of the interventions that we did, and this was an upper, upper respiratory tract infections. We did lots of other things. Uh, we worked on climate change and the availability of food. Uh, we published about that as well. We worked on HIV stigma. Uh, so there were many problems that we, um, and this was maybe not the best example to indeed show how we, collaborated uh, collaborated uh, with the community health workers to reach the community. <clears throat> what we often did is we would have monthly meetings with the community health workers, uh, and we would, um, after we had prioritized our problems, we would teach them about the problems that were most important, and they would, with their once a month uh, visits to, to each household, uh, talk about those problems. And in, in, that, uh, in that way, they would sensitize uh, the households, uh, you know, about what they needed to change in, in their behavior. or so, so we had a lot of other examples where we were actually much more able to, to do that. Yeah. 
there's one online question. What does, uh, what do you do with uh, things like diabetes that are not uh, on, on the priority list? How do you handle that? Yeah, I cut out that slide of my uh, presentation. I should have left it in, I think. Um, so we do a lot of things. There's uh, mobile healthcare clinics. Uh, there's outreach, um, like we did. There's a, a daily sensitization in the healthcare clinics. So where people are invited to come to the healthcare clinics and they get a cup of tea. And there's a lot of uh, people in our rural areas who would come for a cup of, of tea with a bit of milk. Um, and there would be talks, um, uh, preventative talks uh, about uh, you know why it's important to uh, come and screen for diabetes, uh, adhere to your treatment. Uh, so so there were a lot of more initiatives uh, going on. Oh. Yeah, uh, you picked out a few where you did the intervention. Yeah, that. there's a lot of room for improvement. When I was there, we did a surgery. We did a consultation with a hundred mothers with children coming for antibiotics with the upper respiratory tract infection. And only one in 100 got one, you see. But normally 100% got one. So that's the room for improvement. Can you imagine? And you can also understand the fear of a mother. Everybody knows a mother that lost a child of two or three years with a pneumonia. And that's the saddest thing. But there you need community workers because they can be at the homes when the child is having a high respiration rate and detect that early that's important so it's it's fascinating it's fascinating well great we're going to stop this we're going to give majid the floor uh, it's, I think it's Shakib first. Shakib. oh one, Shakib first yes, okay we need oh, one minute to um um change to an online presentation okay that change is going to happen now um but again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Fleur, for this uh, fantastic introduction. And it's even more interesting about what is of all this stuff true in Holland. Um, and uh, Shakib is going to, to do that. Can I introduce him already? Okay. Well, Shakib Sana is a GP in Rotterdam, and he's renowned for his initiative to go to the street to address vaccination hasn't 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 in covid and he's a researcher at Erasmus University and Dutch Family Medicine Association ambassador for Rotterdam so quite impressive and he will tell us about how he is thank operating in Rotterdam um thank you very much um look can i share my own ideas i think it's is here for me. Yes. Flo, do you hear me? Yeah, you hear. Okay. One moment, please. Yes. Dylan. Yeah. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah. And okay. Can you see my slides? Yes. And okay. Thank you very much uh, for. Uh, for your introduction. Um, I have to minimize myself. Uh, let's speaker. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's a quite uh, annoying to talk to uh, to talk to a uh, to a laptop and just seeing your own yourself. Uh, even after three years mm -hmm. of the COVID, um, I have to get used to it. Um, but I'm happy to to take part uh, and I can present something about what we did about the community-oriented uh, uh, primary care here in the, in the Netherlands and in, uh, in the city of Rotterdam. Um, uh, I would go to the next dia. If there are some questions, um, you, uh, which is, um, which has to do something with the content of which I'm telling at that moment, uh, you can interrupt me. If there are other questions for discussion, then it could be later on. So it's no problem. Let's make it interactive. Um, where's my next dia? Oh, I have to do it here. Yes, my own present. My presentation will be about equality and equity. I think I do not have to um, to say something about uh, about these two principles. And I think the whole this red is also kind of a red uh, line throughout my uh, my presentation. 
Um, that's the content of my presentation. I'll there talk about about COVID nineteen. What did it? COVID nineteen spotlighted uh, the the health differences which we have called the health gap. I'll tell you something about the platform Gesundheitsgloof.nl. Actually, uh, in Dutch, it's in English. It would be um, uh, healthgap.nl. Uh, our petition to stop selling cigarettes in deprived neighborhoods and also the quit smoking program. And then we will have some more uh, about, uh, I'll tell you something about the lessons which we have learned, or actually the lesson. Um, yes. Hello? Oh, no, I thought there was a question. Um, uh, this is actually um, more kind of a uh, of a dia which we saw, which we saw in the presentation of Fleur, um, you had a golf cart, and then you have you had also got the suburbs there uh, with the housing of uh, of uh, people in deprived neighborhoods. This is actually if you take a um, a metro a subway ride uh, in Rotterdam, and then you have got a sub uh, life exp expectancy destinations. As we know, the life expectancy in the Netherlands about average about. Um, uh, uh, yeah, 84 to 85 uh, women more than the men, than men on average. Um, but this is the life expectancy of people living in these areas in Rotterdam. Um, and these are people, and this actually this same um, the same life expectancy destinations could also be applied in in in, Den in the Hague, Utrecht, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Eindhoven, and I think in in most of other parts of the world as well. So we see that these people, they live, uh, the people from deprived neighborhoods, they they live shorter, and they if they and they are living shorter, but they are also living in a about fifteen to twenty years in a bad um, bad health. And we are talking not about a, um, a, a developing country, but we are talking about one of the richest countries uh, countries in the world. COVID nineteen made the health gap visible for us. Um, as we see from data from Faros, that the people from the lowest lowest income, they had about two and a half chance, two and a half times more chance to die from COVID-19 in the first year. And they were not the patients um, uh, from the, uh, from, they were not the patients um, uh, very away from us because we saw, I saw as a GP working in the Netherlands and in Rotterdam and deprived neighborhood, I saw those patients. I saw my patients who, who got, uh, who got Corona in the first year and they died. And, but it was uh, quite different. The chance to have Corona um, and a priori chance was much higher by those, uh, by those patients uh, because they were working, uh, yeah, yeah, they were working at uh, jobs where uh, uh, um, uh, online working was not possible. Even the children, they 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 had to go to school, and the children had to. They had there was one laptop at home, so the children got uh, got infected, and then the elderly got infected, and the elderly and the grandfather or grand grandmother uh, they died eventually in the hospital. And also we see that the migration background and that the risk of dying was much higher. And um, this is not astonishing because people from with migration background background not not the expats who are coming right now um as, as a part of uh, Kenneth's economy um uh how do you call it uh, uh, uh as a part of uh, a, a part of working here as a uh, highly skilled highly qualified and skilled um uh, workers but they were people from migration background they were people who were working from uh in about 67 uh, in the year 60s or 70s in the netherlands um and they were uh, from the parts of anatolia or most of them from the parts of uh, uh, uh of morocco with low education skills so those people they start on the letter which we are on the social economic ladder, actually very low, and it takes a, one or two generations, uh, if it if it's possible, to get uh, to get and come to an upper class. There were, but we also saw there was also that was the first year which I talked to, told you um, about the risk and about the uh, risk of dying, and in the second year when there was vaccination, there was low willingness. Uh, of the, to to get vaccinated in disadvantaged neighborhoods, and there was a pressure on our, on the healthcare, and it was a risk to healthcare because of low vaccination rates and the chance of higher vaccine reservoir and re and reinfection. And we had actually in the first um, three or four months about seventy to eighty percent on average the population in the Netherlands they were vaccinated, but uh, we were at least we were um, at that time also at risk of of having the. Uh, having the having the lockdown once again. The reason was that we had um, vaccinated uh, actually an average 
um, uh, healthy population, but a, but a population who took a lot of, uh, who needed a lot of, um, uh, a lot of care, who needed the vaccination at most, they uh, did not get the vaccination because of their fear. Uh, because of the generic information for everyone, this is one size fits all, um, and because of mask mass campaign, camp, vaccination campaign, which lead to a lot of reports of side effects um, and also exposure to disinformation for the people. Uh, and then we had the catalyst as a thrombosis, as a side effect of um, of AstraZeneca vaccine, um, not unknown for a lot of GPs in the Netherlands, and it had got a lot of um, uh, uh, a lot of impact on people. Um, from deprived neighborhood with low education skills and they said i cannot i i don't know what's about 0.01 percent of uh, of chance to get thrombosis i saw my um my uncle or i saw someone in the family who, who got thrombosis and he and he died uh, and he died almost so i'm not going to get it but the people from more um uh, educated uh, uh educated areas of the netherlands of my patients they, they said oh the chance is very low so i want to get it i can i can uh, weigh the weigh the chances and there was also trust in the government was not uh, was at that time very um uh, was also a negative uh, maybe you know the Tuslag affair. I don't know how to how to 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 uh, to uh, 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 translate it in English, uh, but it's a, a very big scandal in the Netherlands, um, which affected a lot of people from the low social economic uh, status, and that was the mistrust in the, uh, in the government was also very high. At that time, we saw. Uh, I'm here, and it's my my colleague, internist, uh, professor of internal medicine at Robin Peters at Erasmus MC. Uh, we we came together, and we saw the people who were not getting vaccinations uh, uh, from the GP. Uh, uh, they were uh, actually eventually they will come to uh, to his um, uh, to his department. So what we did was actually not a not a yeah, not a not a rocket science. We wrote a letter with um, the support of a lot of uh, colleagues. Just call for clear and accessible information about vaccinations for uh, for everyone. And three weeks after that, the minister Rucho de Jonge, the health minister, he came to us and gave us some flyers and flyers to with different with eight or uh, or nine languages. And he saw that the start starts uh, start sign for a for a totally new approach for vaccination. But that was a problem because if you have some flyers, you certainly think that people will get, a, will, will, we can read it. The people can will know what is um, uh, what stats. But if you cannot take the mistrust from them, so what I what we did was with with my colleague Robin Peters, we um, uh, we created Gezondheidskloof.nl, healthgap.nl, uh, and we um, and there are, uh, and we went. Uh, with this platform and with the, with, the, with the GPs, with the nurses, with the elder community elders, uh, with the medical students, with the with the, with the consultants, uh, with, the, uh, with the medical specialists, we went to the marketplaces in Rotterdam, uh, to the churches, to the mosques, to give them information about the vaccination. And if they wanted, then they could also get the vaccination at that time. Um, uh, so that was a, quite a very um, uh, unorthodox way of approaching this uh, because it was not a general um, uh, general regulation from the government. And there were two locations in Rotterdam and the people had to get a vaccination there. But we saw the people also because of their um, uh, of the cost of public transport, they couldn't get there uh, because of their uh, questions that they had got about vaccination, they couldn't get there. So we had doctors and medical students from uh, different countries who also um, with different backgrounds and they also helped us to translate into information and give a personal information for people. And then we saw that people who were in actually and a lot of um uh, a lot of uh, research or, or, or surveys that the people are not willing to get it is actually very um uh, is, is not is, is not willing but if they don't understand the information then they are not going to take it because they are if to make a good decision you have to understand the information that you give to them on a short time, we did about um, about we did about 116 uh, of those sessions. It uh, was was each week in different parts of Rotterdam, and and eventually also in other parts of the Netherlands. Other colleagues they also did the same thing, um, and we uh, and we inform, informed about uh, uh, thousands of people, and also vaccinated about 3,200 people. Most of them from deprived neighborhoods, uh, m more than 60 years of age, uh, who uh, who actually had. Had had been uh, should have been vaccinated uh, actually months ago. 
Um, this was really in the, in the marketplace. We did it with the community, uh, uh, with the community workers. We did it with uh, together with the um, uh, uh, with the medical students. Um, we gave them we gave them information, and also very important with the elderly, uh, with men and women uh, from Morocco, from Turkish, um, are also from Kafedian and um, uh, uh, in, in Suriname's uh, background. They helped us because they were the known figures in the um, in the community. So they also helped us approaching the people. And then when the people, they came to us and if they, they needed the information, the medical information, they came to us and we gave them the medical information. Um, and we did together with, uh, with the colleagues from the municipality, it's a colleague of, from the municipality. And about an, one or a couple of weeks later, the municipality of Rotterdam, they also helped us and they, um, and they took it away. Uh, they took this, um, this program from us. And till now, they have still the same location at Pier 80 in Delfshaven. Every Saturday, it is open for um, uh, for information and for vaccination, um, and we are we are happy about that. And it's still um, uh, supported by the community uh, by the community workers because if we as the GPs as the community workers uh, and with uh, together with the elderly, if we are not going to get to the public uh, domain, public space to um, to uh, to uh, to take part in the prevention, then I think then we are. Um, we will have those people um, uh, 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 in our in our practices with with a lot of uh, uh, COVID infection. So that was a very important lesson for us to learn. Um, uh, yeah. So as I told you, were not only men, but also also uh, also a lot of uh, uh, women who uh, who helped us, and it was very important because we are. Um, uh, they they know how to get to the people. Then they they speak the language of people. I'm not talking about the Turkish language or about the or about the Arabic language, but they also know how to contact the people, how to come to their fear and to give some words to the fear which people have got about their health issues. We also made an um, uh, one of the um, uh, some um, uh, scientific research, and we we interviewed the people who get their vac vaccine vaccine other marketplaces, and we interviewed them. Why are you coming here uh, months after being um, after being invited by the government to get your vaccination here at the marketplace? Uh, besides uh, uh, eggs and tomatoes and uh, and vegetables, they say the accessibility of the vaccination facilities is one of the important thing, and also the the influence of the family in a positive or a negative manner. So it's, if you want to intervene, then you have to take uh, uh, take um, the community also in notice because the family is also part of the community. And those people had a lot of fear. As you see in my conclusion, there is nothing about migration background because migration background did not, because there was one of the ideas, migration background, uh, uh, this is one of the um, uh, uh, one of the reasons that people are not getting vaccinations, but this is that was not the case in our uh, in our uh, population. That was about COVID nineteen. This COVID nineteen, we came out as a G as a GPs, as a medical specialist, as students. We came out of out of our practices, out of the hospital. We came out of the um, uh, study rooms, and we worked together with the elderly uh, just to try to help them with a uh, in a, in a pandemic, um, and. Uh, last year, about a year ago, it's, the, it's, it's October. Uh, October, um, we started to um, uh, because as, as a GP, as a also as a medical specialist, we are worried about the generation uh, which is um, uh, addicted, and we see about twenty thousand of people die in the Netherlands each year about uh, uh, due to the effects of smoking. So we uh, also want to. Um, uh, 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 to uh, advocate a rogue-free generation, this is the smoking-free generation. What we did, um, we um, we made a, a petition. We made a petition from Gesundheitskloof.nl, and we made a petition together with uh, with medical specialists and also with the community elderly. And um, uh, the the, the uh, and our petition was for Albertine and Jump and Jumbo as the two uh, um, leading supermarket uh, chains in the Netherlands, uh, because they are still uh, selling the uh, tobacco products 
in this uh, so, uh, uh, deprived neighborhoods. And they have a lot of tobacco selling point in a deprived neighborhood because there are a lot of people who use them. So it's a kind of a circle, a vicious circle. Um, there are a lot of determinants to get used to smoking. And because they smoke, uh, they are uh, they get sick and they get used, they get used to smoke. And it's very difficult because of a lot of determinants of getting smoking, uh, uh, of smoking, it's very difficult for them to stop. And then the, um, the, the supermarkets and the tobacco industry makes use of it. So um, what we did was actually how we can save the new generation, the children from, uh, from smoking. So we made a petition and we went to the market again. And this time we stand here uh, in front of Albertine. Um, we have the community elders, but we uh, also worked with them uh, in the uh, during COVID, and they are the doctors from the from the hospital as well. And we stand there uh, for um, uh, for one Friday and about two two hours, and we had about about from, uh, more than 500, um, five, 500 um, uh, uh, signatures from people. A lot of people who came to us were from uh, from the uh, uh, de from deprived neighborhoods. They were living there. They came to us. They were smoking. Ninety percent were smoking. They said, uh, "When I was young, I started. There was no one to tell me not to smoke. There was no one to tell me what are the effects, impact, and I could sell. I could buy the cigarette everywhere. But right now, I am very happy that you are standing here, and I want to." Albertine, I, I want to ask Yumbo to stop buy, uh, selling cigarettes because if I go there and I buy cigarettes, of because even if other people buy cigarettes, they, they the children see it. Um, so I would like that stop. So those people helped us, and also with the community workers, they went to the mosque nearby mosque, and and, and hundreds of people came out and they and they, they start talking with us, talking about their own experiences and how they would like to stop it, to stop, uh, and they would they would like to be helped to stop it smoking. Uh, this is my colleague Robin Peters, uh, uh, which we have got a lot of. Uh, um, uh, uh, we did a lot in the uh, uh, in, in the public space. Um, uh, yeah, this this was this mosque was situated here, and a lot of people after the Friday uh, Friday prayer, uh, they came to us and they, they 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 talked to us, and it was very um, at about three or four o'clock uh, in the uh, uh, in the afternoon. Uh, the 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 people from uh, from the mosque they came and they gave us food and some drinks they said you are standing here um, uh, on your uh, on your busy day for us for our children so we as a community we want to thank you and want to help you with that not only the the elderly but also the medical students and so it's also very important for us to work with medical students because to have they are actually the doctors of the future and they want to help us here and standing understanding the community uh, when i was a doctor i i uh, studied studied um, um in the in the classrooms when i when after my um after my graduation I, I came to the public space, but actually the public space is here, the public space where the people get sick, the public space where we see a lot of determinants which make our patients sick, that actually it starts here. Thank you. And we are about more than uh, 5,000 uh, 5, signatures in, in, about, uh, in about a month. And as you know, that, uh, um, that I, I don't know if it's because of our petition, but I will say yes, Albert and Jimbo. And there is also a, uh, they are stopping smoking uh, uh, legally. They have to stop smoking cigarettes um, from 1 uh, January 2024. The last one, um, it's about uh, grip, op gezond, grip, en, grip en gezondheid. Um, uh, we work together with Erasmus University, uh, where I do also my PhD, and with, uh, with, uh, uh, with Gemeente Rotterdam, municipality of Rotterdam. And what we do is um, there is uh, just to, to help people um, uh, how uh, to quit smoking. Because um, as we need, recap again, um, we saw that people living in the private neighborhood, they, they live 15 years in a in a low, uh, in actually in bad health, and they die about uh, six years earlier. There was a, um, uh, a, a, a scientific research about it. This is a, a there was a design article that was published, but it was also a research um, that if you help the people by reducing their their stress, 
by reducing the ter determinants which give them stress and they smoke, then it will help them to stop smoking. Um, so that what there was a pilot and the pilot was successful. And so uh, after that, uh, we tried to, uh, from the university, we tried to, and also with the program Grip of Gesundheit, um, uh, to do it, uh, to actually to include uh, a larger population uh, after the pilot, just to see if the intervention will help again. The two important questions, smoking, why do people smoke and how can the people be motivated or think about quitting smoking? I stay there as if you have a lot of uh, puzzles in your head, which is not uh, in, 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 uh, in your head. And you have to um, think about your uh, uh, the, the next day, if you have your um, money to buy your groceries, then I think you will not have a lot of time or space in your head, uh, in your mind to think about quit smoking, even if quit, if smoking costs money. It's a behavioral change wheel of Suzanne Michi. Um, I think uh, uh, a lot of us will know it. And, and actually, this is the capability, opportunities, or motivation. If you want to, the personal motivation, if you want to stop it. But it's also important, how do you enable people? What are the environment? How do you want to you can restructure the environment? Uh, and also about regulations. We can do, what we can do is just to, 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 to come to this circle. We have to uh, facilitate with the regulations, but also facilitate this from the environmental, uh, um, from the persuasion, uh, and also the uh, to train the people and, and so, that, so, that, so that we can enable them. And this is a stop. Uh, as in Africa, they say to raise a child, you need a uh, you need a village to raise a child. And actually, see the same thing to uh, to educate uh, someone, you need actually the whole society. Financial difficulties, of stress, smoking, and the health um, uh, health experiment. Actually, this important. It's, it is known for us as a doctor, and a lot of patients from deprived neighborhoods. If we talk them, they know it. If we talk them after if they get diabetes, they have hypertension, they have got um, a cardiac diseases. If we ask them, do you smoke? Um, about eighty percent smoke. And if I ask them, when you started smoking, about 99% say when they were 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years of age. So at that time, they started smoking. And right now, why it's difficult to get stopped? Yeah, because I have got a lot of my patients, I've got a lot of stress, and I cannot think of smoking, and smoking gives me a lot of uh, support. So what you try with this program is to uh, to do to give some stress management courses and also give with the body and the body helps you to uh, to to reduce your uh, 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 to reduce your pro your practical problems. If you have got financial problems, there are some uh, agencies in and in, in Rotterdam where they can go and they can talk about about their financial problems. Uh, so we hope that this will also reduce the stress and this will also reduce the using of tobacco. So in a, in a small pilot, it worked, but it was to work it to do the same thing in a larger population. But then it's an important question, how you get to those people. Because if you do a research, normally we see only the people who are willing, they will come. But we have to, if you want to, to, to approach the community and as a researcher, if you want to, 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 to look which intervention you have to uh, apply to reach the people uh, who, are, who need it most, then you have to work with them together. Then you have to co-create because we have got inclusion issues. Um, uh, this is Kenneth van Straat. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a behoefte, it's a need, a wetenschap. Uh, it's about the science, uh, what we know from practice, and it's a program. But it's the Kenneth van der Straat. This what Kenneth van der Straat means, the knowledge from the street, the street, street wisdom. And street wisdom is important because this is the, 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 the collective wisdom of people. How can you get there? Um, we, as a researchers, we can be said, okay, theoretical, we, 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 you have to stop smoking because it's bad for your health. We went to the, um, we, want, we made a session to train the trainer together with those elderly, which we were at our marketplaces. And they said to us, no, don't start about this is bad for your health. We know it start about we have got stress the stress is for us very important so with, in talking with them and we actually co-created our intervention how to reach the people to include the people 
and it had effect. So we also trained the trainer, we also trained the community elders, and they uh, went and also to include the people for the uh, um, uh, the smokers for the uh, for this program. Uh, and that was a that was a reset of the inclusion okay. process. Wait, exactly. Yeah. This was for us the inclusion so of. Uh, someone to cover for this was the, the start of the inclusion process for us. Uh, someone has got, yeah, okay, I don't hear it now. Um, uh, actually, these these people in in green hashes, um, they are green jackets, and this is the she is um, in a kapala. Maybe maybe um, uh, uh, someone of a lot of you will know her. She is the she's the uh, she's the conscious of Delshaven. She has um, helped us a lot during COVID nineteen process. She is a street epidemiologist and uh, sacrificed her life still for uh, for the for for the street and the street wisdom. And these are the people, the community elders who helped us during all of the programs which we have got. And right now they are helping us because we are looking if you uh, engage the community elder, not only interventions during a pandemic, but if also include them um, and co-create with them the, the, the scientific interventions. And I hope that it will also um, give another kind of, another light on how we look at the street wisdom. Because street wisdom and the community wisdom is very important for us just to check and fine tune if the our scientific um, goals our scientific extract does it also work, or it's only theoretical? There was a link from. Uh, they needed the people. But one more important thing: there was no um, that there, there was no uh, uh, on the, the, the program has six uh, six sessions, and there was no session with a doctor. And one thing with the people um, who came to the sessions, they told us from the community elderly, uh, we also need a session with a doctor just to tell us and to ask to give answer to our questions related to our health. Actually, the same thing which we did uh, uh, during the COVID-19. So um, and in July this year, we also uh, give them, there were doctors, and they also, uh, they gave information on, on those sessions. Uh, it was mostly online um, uh, because it was during the during the summer vacations so doctor give uh, give online the um, the uh, uh, took uh, took part online to those uh, sessions and he answered the questions the questions of people about vaping about using drugs about the the bad um, uh, the bad effects of uh, of smoking on their health but also about the psychological help which they need and how should they quit stop quit smoking i don't know what's happening now yeah. As I told you, it's all about equality and about equity. Um, if we want to change the uh, uh, change the life expectancy for our patients and those are daily patients, if we want to do it, then we have to do something about um, about uh, actually the injustice way of dealing. We are uh, giving of resources, the same resources for everyone. And we see that not all people, not all of them can um, can benefit from those resources. But we what we uh, what we want, I'm starting, if I give my own example, I'm starting from my my father was a doctor and we came to the Netherlands and I start in a different part in the social economic economic ladder, but uh, stairs. But for someone whose parents they came from um, uh, uh, from the uh, from the mountains of Anatolia uh, without an education to work in a, uh, to work in a fabric, it's very difficult to get to the same place. It's not impossible, but it's difficult to get to the same place. So we, as a society, we have to um, make a um, uh, 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 make make a. Uh, make a choice that we sh should not give the resources, the same resources for everyone, because only a few will benefit. We have to give the resources and just to look uh, uh, um, uh, to look at the um, uh, to tailored tailored made interventions, tailored made um, uh, allocation of the resources which we have got. Uh, if we don't do it, then um, uh, about twenty or forty years, we as doctors, as GPs. Are, we are still helping the people uh, with uh, uh, with heart attacks, with diabetes, uh, because and very early in their life, not and they will not get the same life expectancy of 84, 85 years in the Netherlands, but they will die at their 60 or at their 55 from a heart attack. 
The most important lesson for me, I think there's one lesson, Johan Krauf, the, the, the famous footballer, um, he said, you have to see as you door it. You will see it if you understand it, or you will understand it if you see it. And it's very important for us, for us as doctors as well, because a lot of decades we thought that prevention, decades we thought that the community approached care that's, that's actually something for others, for the municipality. But no, this is also a very important part of our work, not for us only, but also for the policymakers. Uh, and um, uh, 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 if we, as a doctor, I know that we have a lot of, we have a little time, we have a lot of patients, but at this time, we are at the changing point at this moment, because after COVID, it brought us a lot of uh, issues, a lot of problems, but it also opened our eyes how we can look at the society, just to have to build it and engineer it in a different way, so that we can give the people the opportunity to make their own uh, uh, healthy choices. If we, uh, because we are not doing different or something else than the oath which we made when we became doctor. Because second part of our of our oath it says, uh, "I will uh, I will cure the sick people, but I will also uh, advocate the um, the health." Ik zal voor de zieken zorgen, maar ook zal de gezondheid bevorderen. And I think um, this is the right time to also embarrass, uh, embrace the the, the the second part of this uh, medical oath. Yes, we have to give the right and state-of-the-art care for our patients. And yes, we have to work community approach so that we can um, uh, prevent the people getting sick in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is a very wide lesson you learned, it. and uh, I'm amazed to, to to hear this whole story about two battles you won: one battle with the COVID vaccination and one battle with smoking. Um, there's little time for questions now and stories because the the other speakers we also have to give them their time. Um, but you said one important thing that is a bridge to my Liberia uh, is that doctors don't need a seat. Yeah. That is familiar to Okay. But okay. All right. Okay, then Cornelia will be first. Okay, but Majid of Majid, uh, you said something that the doctors don't need a team, or they need a team, but the team needs the doctor. And that's something you shall remember. But maybe I introduce now to you Cornelia from the UK. She will be also presenting online. And um, she's a part time senior clinical fellow on the innovation and evaluation team of the National Insurance House, Northwest London Applied Research Collaboration within the Department of Primary Care and Public Health. And NIRSC, the National Institute for Health Research, and she combines her academic work with clinical work as a GP in Westminster and as a public health specialist in, at Westminster City Council uh, and the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. She's also currently a SPIN fellow in Westminster, looking at how the newly created community roles and primary care can be integrated into existing services. She's leading on the expansion of community health and well-being workers across Westminster. Well, this is such a long introduction that you probably don't have much time to speak, sorry. But uh, maybe I can give the word to you now, Cornelia. Very Thank welcome you. to the Netherlands. Thank you for the lovely introduction. And um, I just want to check, uh, do, can people see my slides? Not yet. Oh, okay. Uh, let me just. Hmm. Okay. Um. How about now? It's loading. Yeah, now we see it. Excellent. Okay. I'll it's go. Yeah, great. Perfect. 
Thank you. Lovely. So um, thank you for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me. I'm very excited to, to tell you about the community health and well-being workers uh, in Westminster. They're inspired by the Brazilian family health strategy. So we, we heard from Fleur about um, how community um, medicine is done in Africa. And I love the um, precision medicine because that's exactly what it is uh, in a hyper-local approach. And, um, and uh, Matt Harris actually, who is a, um, a researcher at Imperial brought this over as a an example of reverse innovation from a low middle income country as a frugal innovation. It took about 17 years to get this um, tried out in the UK because what can we possibly learn from a low income country? But um, the WHO now recommends uh, community health workers as a cost effective solution in high income countries as well. So. Um, I just wanted to tell people a little bit about um, how general practice works in the UK. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I think it's quite similar from what Fleur said in in the UK as it is in, in the Netherlands. Um, there are small businesses contracted by the NHS, so the main contract is with the National Health Service. They're gatekeepers to specialties, so you need a referral into secondary care via GP. Um, GPs undergo a three-year training after their two-year foundation training, so um, two years spent in, in hospital and one year uh, as a registrar in general practice. And um, a GP in the UK has about 3,000 patients per GP, and uh, most GP practices now have up to 50,000 patients. Um, so uh, I just want to tell you quickly about the Brazilian family health strategy, where this idea comes from. So in Brazil, this started uh, during a cholera epidemic when they needed people to quickly deliver dialyzed sachets and water to people in the community. And they hired local people from that community to do that and then realized that they've stumbled on some really useful community infrastructure and, and kind of build this out. Now uh, they have 250,000 community health workers in 37,000 primary care team covering about 70% of the population. Uh, and each uh, GP practice has about uh, four to six community health workers. Each community health worker covers about 150 households on a particular geographical patch and uh, they practice proactive regular outreach to those areas so it's uh, what Fleur was talking about the the proactive outreach that's based on geography not necessarily on need so it's about relationship building with those um, households that they are assigned to and doing a whole array of things from health promotion to chronic disease support to looking at holistically the wider determinants of health and what they found in the last um, uh, over 20 years in in Brazil is that um, you can see really big outcomes um, in randomized studies that take into account uh, confounders such as uh, social demographic variables or ge geography. So ambulatory care sensitive hospitalizations down by 13%, cardiovascular disease mortality down by 36%, or oh, sorry, um, stroke mortality down by 31%, reduced horizontal inequity, reduced racial inequity, breastfeeding rates increased, immunization, perinatal outcome, you name it. So I just want to preface this, we're not already doing this. So I'm going to tell you why particularly the uh, Brazilian uh, model is, is um, different. So I know community health workers, we heard about them in Africa. I know they exist in China and in India, but um, what makes, so, so the, the design code or the strands of DNA of this model are four. First of all, it's people from that community for that community. So it's hyper-local. Um, it's comprehensive at the household level. It's integrated in the GP practice and local authority, and it's proportionately universal. So it's it's universal to start off with. Um, they look after everybody in there. So if you live in a building, you have a, a community health worker. If you move out of that building, you lose that community health worker. But they spend more time proportionally in, in the households where they observe need. And this is really important. Um, we heard from Shakib about, um, you know, uh, people not not coming to to practices or um, 
not 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 realizing themselves that they have a need and, and the community health workers can see that so they have identified child carers who are the only people sort of 10 years old who who organize the entire family have access to the internet um book hospital appointments come to the gp as an interpreter and it took the community health worker to say you shouldn't be doing that um we've got other people who can help you and also spotting mental health problems in those children um when the adults around them didn't really recognize that so so they they spot the need and so these are our four community health workers that we hired in um 2021 there were volunteers in the community um and uh ha have been helped into employment and these are this is churchill gardens so churchill gardens is one of the most deprived um estates in the country in the bottom 10 percent most deprived areas in in england um there is a life expectancy gap of 18 years between men living in Churchill Gardens and men living 15 minutes up the road in Belgravia in, in London. Um, in You can see the color coding. So uh, each color is a community health worker. We only have four community health workers. So half, have, uh, half of those buildings have a community health worker and the other half were serving as controls in the evaluation. So what are the benefits that we saw after one year in um, one year of them working with 500 households uh, on the on the estate? So um, they helped in in all of these areas, medicines, compliance, help with housing and employment. So as we heard already from Shakib, um, when when people have other bigger fish to fry, they worry about their housing, they worry about antisocial behavior, health is the last thing on their mind. Um, they 60% of the conversation in the first year were dominated by um, sorting out housing issues, schooling issues, employment, uh, financial issues. Um, we saw examples of suicide prevention, bereavement support, carer support, crisis mitigation, um, promoting health prevention opportunities, identification of child carers, um, early recognitions of uh, cognitive decline, uh, starting community um, initiatives such as walking groups, um, combating loneliness. And so the quantitative analysis from this showed that, so first of all, we helped four people into employment in that local um, estate. Uh, we reached about 40% of households after one year, 60% after a year and a half, and that demonstrates just how hard it is in such a traumatized community to, to build that trust. Um, uh, one, uh, one of the leaders in NHS England on, on health inequality said that um, trust has emerged as one of the most important um, determinants of health during the COVID pandemic, and that's certainly true. Um, they reached about 2.3 households on uh, on average per per month, and that's because they they only had half of the capacity in the first year, and also because of the profound need. Um, in those households that had a community health worker, they were 47% more likely to have the immunizations that they were eligible for, and 82% more likely to have um, cancer screening, screening and cardiovascular checks that they were eligible for. And we saw a GP, um, a, a drop of 7% of unscheduled GP visits. And so in, in England, we're, we're currently, um, the hot topic is population health management. So we, we're really uh, interested in uh, drilling down in the data. And somebody said before, um, it's, it's, um, it's really important that we look at um, hyper-local areas because particularly in Westminster where we've got um, predominantly affluent population, population the average hides um, some, some really stark inequalities. And this is, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with this, this is um, um, the story of Abraham Wald, who was a statistician in World War II in, in the US Army, and he was asked where to put um, reinforcing 
uh, plating on the on the battle um, planes, and they looked at the battles that had come back from ba uh, battle and the planes that had come back from battle, and they saw that they they wanted to put the plating where there's most of the bullet holes, and he said no, the the plating needs to go where there's no bullet holes because he recognised that there was survival bias that that the um, planes that you looked at were the ones that actually made it home, and that the ones that were shot down. Uh, were not available for inspection. And this is kind of how, what we discovered in, in Churchill Gardens, that actually we we spend a lot of time thinking about people who frequently visit A&E and GP, and that's kind of our impression that there's overuse. But we've discovered a lot of people who don't use either. They don't go to the GP. They don't, they're not known to the GP. They don't go to A&E and um, sit in the community with a lot of health problems getting worse. And then this um, proportional versus targeted, just a quick um, note on that, uh, that um, we we tend to focus at the sharp end uh, because um, th there's a demonstrable need and um, it's justified, but actually uh, we need to work on stopping people scooching into that um, sharp end category in the first place where, where it's really expensive and almost impossible to fix. So um, what's happening at the moment, so we in Westminster, we're scaling the community health workers to 20 by December this year, and we're hoping to reach 60 community health workers in the next five years. Um, just to say that the community health workers are employed by the local authority at the moment, but they will transition to the local voluntary sector um, and uh, be paid through NHS funding. This is really important that they're paid. Actually, Fleur mentioned this and somebody asked about that. Um, what, what's their remuneration and is it sustainable? To make it sustainable, people have to be paid. You can't have the same trust and um, reliability. They need to be trained in um, uh, patient safeguarding, etc. They need to be connected in with the right people to be effective. So um, this is not something that a volunteer can do. Um, we have a community of practice led by the National Association of Primary Care, and we've now scaled into about 20 um, areas in around England that are um, piloting this or about to pilot this. Um, there are different funding mechanisms and integration. It's going to be really interesting looking at the fidelity of this model. And here, just um, sharing some pictures of um, them, uh, the community health workers receiving um, breastfeeding support training from the Human Human um, Milk Foundation. Uh, we're training them in justice in listening and open dialogue, which are dialogical approaches to um, mental health creation. Uh, dementia training was a, one of the asks from the community health workers about um, a gap. They hold uh, monthly coffee mornings in the community and they're often themed. So we had housing, we had the pharmacist from the practice come and talk about antibiotics. Uh, last month we came and talked uh, about uh, dementia with the community. And um, in terms of evaluation, we are planning a cluster randomized study for a more uh, robust formal evaluation of um, prevention opportunities. We're also looking at the intersectionality between those, um, those conditions that drive health inequities the most um, with process mapping, looking at what the community health workers do. So we have a program in, in England, it's called Core 20 plus five, which is um, uh, our, our kind of program around health inequalities and health inequities. Uh, they've identified five um, core conditions which drive the health inequities in, in England in the bottom 20% of the most deprived. And um, I always call my community health workers the core 20 plus five on steroids because they do all of these things because they build relationships and they personalize their approach. So uh, often we talk about groups and sort of Somali population or but um really if you've met one Arab arabic person you've met one arabic person and the 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 reasons for not getting vaccinated are um really different from person to person and um really all you need to do is talk to that person and and find out and do some hand holding 
So I, I'm going to um, stop here just to say that um, we have, um, so it fits into the ecosystem, the community health workers have inspired the Octopus in Westminster, which is our integrated neighborhood team, and we're trying to build uh, better relationships between all of our assets in the community, all of our connector roles, the family navigators, the uh, health and well-being coaches and all of those we 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 are very good at the transactional but it's really not good enough because we we have a lot of referral pathways and eligibility criteria and uh, residents fall in between those um, liminal spaces between the services and we need to have a more intelligent approach and a personalized approach and a very hyper local approach to primary care and I'm, I'm very conscious of time so I'm I'm going to stop here and take questions. Thank you very, very much, Bonnie. This is a, a very, very impressive presentation. My goodness. Such a huge study and, and such a convincing evidence that prevention works. Lots of people are still skeptical about putting money in prevention and following. And even especially politicians. But if you see these numbers and if you hear the story, it's impressive. I just heard Fleur is already wanting to repeat this study in the Netherlands. So I think that would be very promising. Um, we do and one question just to relieve the mood and then we, we quickly go on with the last, a lot shorter presentation. And then we hope to have some time left for a few more questions. Okay, where's the one question? No question? Is there a chat coming in? Nothing? Okay, then thank you very much, Tony. I'm going to the last presentation, Majid Baraya, a GP in the practice in Oakmere in Osdorp in the Wildemanswijk. And she is a practice uh, uh, from that originated in Dapper Doctors, which is actually fearful doctors. And she's a, 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 a power practice. And she's going to tell us about that because she told me just that this story that teams tell her, please, we need every now and then a doctor. Instead of all these doctors thinking we need teams to be more effective, we should look from it the other way around, put the pyramid upside down. So she's going to tell us about that. I'm very intrigued. It's going to be in Dutch, but maybe I give one or two lines in, in the end for the people who haven't understood anything from it. Okay. Fleur heeft me gevraagd of ze vertellen over mijn ervaring, ik weet niet of ik, over mijn ervaring in het werken in de achterstand buurt, met name van krachtige basiszorg. Um, ik ga jullie vertellen dat ik uh, sinds 2016 eigen praktijk heb in de Wildeman buurt, is een, een klein wijkje in Osdorp. Uh, het is een achterstandwijk, maar het is ook de meeste criminele wijk in de Osdorp, in heel Amsterdam. Dus het is een wijk met heel veel stigma. Ik ben daar gaan werken. Ik ben zelf in een case, vluchteling. Ik denk, nou, ik kan daar wat betekenen. Ik merkte dat ik eigenlijk in de, in de loop van de tijd, dat ik tekort schoot. Of niet begreep wat mensen, uh, wat ze meemaken. En daar wil ik even iets over vertellen. Nou, en ik denk dat dit de voornaamste reden is waarom ik mensen niet begreep. Omdat ik vanuit mijn inzichten keek. En niet vanuit hun inzicht. Uh, mensen in de Wildemanbuurt, die hebben continu te maken met toxisch sterk, stress, chronisch stress. Nou, wat mijn patiënten meemaken, dat heb ik nooit meegemaakt. Nou, slechte woning, financiële problemen, nou, LVD-problematiek, laagverstandelijk beperkt, niet zo gezondheidsvaardigheden. Uh, en 
Dus continu bevriezen. Niet goed kunnen nadenken wat hun volgende stap is. Nou, en ik moet eerlijk zeggen dat dit post-COVID heel veel stress gaf aan mij, maar ook aan ons team. Veel meer agressie, veel meer onbegrip, veel meer contacten. Patiënten kwamen steeds terug. En onbegrip wat er gebeurt, dus kreeg ook een overbelast team. Dus het gaf stress aan de patiënten, maar ook aan mij. Vorig jaar ben ik ingestapt in de krachtige baaszorg. Krachtig baaszorg is een initiatief van Zilverkruis. Het begon eerst in Utrecht en is overgestroomd naar Den Haag, Rotterdam en Amsterdam. De principe van krachtig baaszorg is meer een werkwijze. En dat is, het begint met het vier domeinen model. Het vier domeinen model is met name opgericht dat als de patiënt bij je komt, dat je meer holistisch kijkt. Dus niet meer vragen naar alleen maar het lichamelijke, maar ook de maatschappelijk, sociaal of de geestelijke. Wat ik vaak doe, is dat als, als een gesprek vastloopt, dat ik dan zeg van ja, dat lichaam, dat klachten, dat weet ik nu wel. Want ik weet dat je hoofdpijn hebt, maagpijn. Maar ik wil verder kijken. Ik wil weten hoe het met je vrijwillige werk zit. Hoe het met je wonen zit. Hoe het met je justitie en financiën. Hoe het sociaal zit. Hoe is het met je gezin? Hoe zit het nou met het sociale steunsysteem? En we, we vragen ook dan, hoe zit het verder met je coping? Hoe los je problemen op? Maar ook, hoe zit het met je? Ben je depressief? Ben je somber? Wat maak je mee? Tijdens zo'n gesprek viel me op dat ik natuurlijk altijd vroeg naar stress. Maar negen van de tien mensen zeiden tegen mij, als ik zeg stress, zeiden ze nee, ik heb geen stress. En naar aanleiding van echt specifiek deze 4D-model te gebruiken... En daarna ook aan patiënten zelf te vragen. Wat wil jij dat ik voor je doe? Wat wil je veranderen aan je situatie? Zag ik al heel snel dat, ik, dat patiënten in die gesprek van een kwartiertje, gingen wel van tien minuten naar een kwartier, van de chaos in hun hoofd meer structuur krijgen. Ik zag ook gewoon echt zo'n belletje. Van, ik wil dat je dit voor me doet. Dus we gingen, ik ging meer kijken, van, niet van mijn perspectief, maar meer van, hé, hey, hoe is het om jou te zijn? En, en wat heb je nodig om verder te gaan? Nou, dus we hebben eigenlijk, dat doen we, dus als je dit al de problemen hebt, en de problemen zijn vaak niet somatisch, dat kan ik je wel zeggen, het zit er vaak meer in een maatschappelijk hoek, in een sociale hoek, dan wel psychiatrie. Heb je daarna is het tweede pijl. Is dat je dan met je wijk gaat overleggen. En die wijk houdt in dat we om de zes weken een overlegstructuur hadden. Dat we gestart zijn eigenlijk met de maatschappelijk werk. In Nederland de buurteam in Amsterdam. En de welzijnwerkers. En dat is welzijn op recept. En um, dus om de zes weken hebben we een overleg met de... Met Twee huisartsen van mijn praktijk, dus de POAGGZ, de buurteam en de welzijn op recept. En daarbij aansluitend uh, nodigen we mensen uit. We, onder andere mee, uh, cliëntenondersteuner, maar ook GGD overlast en advies om hun casus te bespreken. Om de zes weken bespreken wij casussen van die patiënten en elke zes weken komen die casussen ook terug. Met oplossingen. Of probleem waar ze tegenaan lopen. Wat heel mooi om te zien is dat iedere vak, en dat is eigenlijk in de Wildermanbuurt heel goed georganiseerd, maar in de rest van Nederland ook, heel veel grote expertise hebben in hun vakgebied, maatschappelijk, sociaal. En zo keken we anders naar het problemen en lossen we het ook anders de problemen op. Dus we weken overstijgend en we hebben ook een gedeelde verantwoordelijkheid. Sommige problemen kunnen we het niet oplossen, maar we hebben daardoor ook wel dat we over die problemen praten. Dus um, ik heb wel wat Dus we keken eigenlijk met alle, al die puzzelstukjes. Keken we. Kwamen eigenlijk op hun plek terecht. We, 
Dus ik ging eigenlijk op zoek naar de vraag achter de klacht. En deze vraag achter de klacht komt niet alleen van mij, kan ook van een welzijnwerker zijn, dan wel maatschappelijk werker. Ik ga even een paar voorbeelden noemen, want ik heb eigenlijk sinds die korte jaar, nou anderhalf jaar dat we nu bezig zijn, veel meer casussen en veel meer mensen gezien en wat hun vragen dan wat we waren. Ik had wel een casus van iemand met hartkloppingen. Toen we doorgingen met het 4D-model, bleek dat ze eigenlijk aan het werk was, maar ook overbelast was met de zorg van haar ouders die dementerend zijn. Of een vader die dementerend is. En die vader zou eigenlijk een patiënt worden van mij in de praktijk. Wat we gedaan hebben samen, sowieso de casus besproken. En we zijn, we zijn eigenlijk ingestapt. We gaan vaak naar mensen toe, dus de welzijnwerker of de buurtteam. Die gaat naar de patiënt toe. Of naar die familie toe om te bespreken wat de oplossing kan zijn. We hebben de buurtteam heeft een, de huis ingericht op basis van zijn dementie. Zodat hij veel meer van, eigenlijk daar vrij kan zijn. De financiën hebben we aangepakt. De ergotherapeut heeft met die vrouw leren koken. Want ze moest één keer koken uh, van gas, gasplaat. Dus van een uh, elektrische plaats, plaat van gas. Het gaf heel veel stress. Uh, we hebben de huis nogmaals aangepast aan de dementie van de man. Met de welzijn zijn we een vrijwilliger hebben gezocht voor die man. En we zijn achtergekomen dat hij eigenlijk een man is van tuineren. Hij houdt van tuineren, hij houdt een huis. En we zijn daardoor met, we gingen daarom eens praten, hoe kunnen we ervoor zorgen dat de wijk ook een project krijgt, een tuinproject. En we zijn een tuinproject gestart voor dementerenden in heel Oostdorp. Die komen in de, in de tuin en ze gaan... Het kan beginnen de mensen zijn, je hoeft niet de diagnose de mensen te hebben, maar ze gaan één keer per week uh, lunchen, vrijwilligers komen erbij, uh, mantelzorgers komen erbij en ze gaan ook tuineren. Een andere casus die heel herkenbaar is, is een Marokkaanse dame die elke dag, elke dag op spreek was. Omdat ze pijn had, ze is misselijk, ze gaf over, haar man is agressief, want die wilde alleen medicatie. Elke dag werd 1 in 2 gebeld. Elke dag was er een SCH-bezoek. Dat betekent dat ze elk, dat ze, ze had medicijnen, 10 fentanyl, met, uh, tramadol, nou, morfine. En de medicijnen stapelden zich op. Door thuis te gaan kijken bij die patiënten, door te zorgen dat de thuiszorg de medicatie overnam, dat het buurtteam bij patiënten de vertrouwen teruggaf. En ook zorgde dat ze de contacten met het ziekenhuis onderhouden. Of de SCH. Hebben we ervoor. En we hebben de GGZ gevraagd om die medicatie te neren. Hebben we weer rust teruggebracht. Er blijken twee laagverstandelijke patiënten te zijn. Die overbelast werden door het systeem. Maar ook in stress raakten door heel veel klachten. Nou, ze kwam terug en de enige wat zei. Hoe kan ik mijn diabetes reguleren? Nou, terwijl ze daarvoor geen één keer ruimte had om die diabetes te reguleren. Dus we kregen daardoor om van echt te zoeken naar de vraag achter de klacht. En niet op somatisch gebied te kijken. Meer de puzzelstukjes op elkaar. En de patiënten kwamen in beweging. Ze kwamen terug met... Ja, het, je voelt gewoon dat ze gezien worden en gehoord... En ze, kwamen, ze gaven ook aan, ik heb alleen dit van u nodig, dokter. Want ik weet dat mijn klachten niet lichamelijk zijn. Fleur had dat ook gezegd. Ik heb een, een donkere man met vitiligo. En die is in Afrika. Dat is echt een hele zwaar leven. En die kwam. Die zegt, ja, dokter, ik weet dat het niet lichamelijk is. Maar ik wil dat u deze brief voor me ondertekent. En hij ging weg. Ze komen binnen. Van, u heeft het druk, dokter. Ik wil alleen u bedanken, dat het, ik wil alleen zeggen dat het goed gaat. Ik ben blij dat uw team iets voor me doet. En die team bedoelt ze niet mijn team. Ze bedoelt daarbij ook de buurteam, de welzijnwerker. Of de cliëntenondersteuner die daarbij zit. Ik merkte eigenlijk al een jaar, echt een, nogmaals, dat heel snel dat er veel rust kwam in de praktijk. Maar ook dat er heel veel lege dagplekken zijn. En dat is ook beweten hier bij de onderzoek die Niffel heeft uitgevoerd in opdracht van Silver Kruis. Daar kwam al aan, binnen, ik kan even niet zien. in 2019 werd de 
uh, controlegroep of de startgroep uh, gevraagd in 2020. Er werd weer gevraagd en er is een significant verschil in, in artsen die zeggen, ik heb het gevoel dat ik patiënten, of er uh, wordt een ver, vermindering eigenlijk gezien van het gevoel, ik had het gevoel dat, het, dat, patiënten, dat ik de patiënt tekort doe. En hier staat het ook. Ik heb het gevoel dat ik patiënten tekort doe, doordat ik te weinig tijd heb voor de patiënten. En eigenlijk voor het start van de krachtenbaaszorg gaven de artsen aan dat ze 39%. En na de start, dus na een jaar, 16%. Dus mensen, je voelt direct dat, ze dat, dat je gewoon echt beter patiënt kan helpen. En ook een daling van het gevoel dat je patiënten niet de juiste zorg had. Daarbij kwam het veel meer ruimte voor overleg. Je hebt meer overleg, maar ook meer tijd voor overleg. En uh, we kregen ook veel meer tijd voor het team, voor onszelf. En uh, met name ik, maar ook de, uh, de team gaf aan dat ze veel meer steun hebben, dat ze veel meer de problemen kunnen oplossen. We hadden eigenlijk veel meer voordelen, maar dit waren wel de significante voordelen van de uh, werken met krachtenbaaszorg. Er werd ook een uh, eigenlijk kostenoverweging. Dus er werd gezien, in de, met name in Overvecht, Overvecht in Utrecht, uh, dat er ook een, de een, te vergelijken met de controlegroep uh, minder DBC's op de polykliniek werd er. Uh, geopend. Dus mensen werden minder doorverwezen naar de uh, tweede lijn. Wel meer doorverwezen naar de fysiotherapeut, wel naar de ergotherapeut. Dus je wilt iets in de wijk is, maar minder naar de tweede lijn. En ook bij de GGZ werd er 15% uh, eigenlijk minder kosten gemaakt uh, doordat er minder verwijzing zijn. De stake-home message. Door de gebruik van 4D-model heb je meer zicht op de complexe Problematiek. Patiënten weten zelf beter wat ze nodig hebben. Uh, nou, de volgconsulten zijn veel meer uh, minder somatisch gericht. Wat voor zorgt dat je ook meer ruimte hebt om iets uh, te bespreken met patiënten. Patiënten hebben, waarderen ook de aandacht die je geeft. Uh, wij verwijzen als huisarts minder naar tweede lijn. En samenwerken met de wijk geeft meer werkplezier, voldoening en echt meer tijdwinst. Uh, dan daarvoor. Dank je wel. Dank je, Magiek, voor dit fantastische verhaal. En het is toch een ongelooflijk pleidooi. Het is eigenlijk een incredible plea voor knowing who can help you. Er is this huge group. And you've shown with scientific evidence that it works, that you become better as a doctor. So how stupid can you be to not involve all these people? I think that was very, a very powerful plea. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, yeah, there's very little time left, but I want to have a few questions. Uh, um, They can be in Dutch or in English, it doesn't matter so much. Um, who wants to ask something to any of the former speakers? Because I hope they're still online. And everybody who's online, be sure that we stop at 9.30 precisely. I know how you suffer behind your screen. And this is the disadvantage of this webinar business. But you, you'll, very, you'll be relieved. But please stay on a bit. Oké, okay. question? Is that chat coming in? Uh, sorry, but uh, Claire has a question. Okay. Claire? I think there's questions. Right. I have a question for Majid, maybe also for uh, Connie. Um, how do you start as a family, as a GP uh, in working in Europe, so in the Netherlands or London, and you don't have the Imperial College behind you, and you don't have... Uh, I'm not sure how you start at krachtige basiszorg, like, but if you would like to start as a GP, how do you do that? And and the, oh yeah, you can't. In Amsterdam, they have the ELA's also. I think it's also 
a financial uh, practice cost a lot of uh, time to start krachtig work, but it's also also a financial. It is uh, you get the, from the ELA in Amsterdam, and um, the most important thing is the finance, but it's come from the uh, from Zilver Kruis, our zorgverzekering. So they asked the the Wijkzorg, the ELA here to start it. In Amsterdam, we have 20 practices of krachtig baasroor. I don't know what in, in Rotterdam or Den Haag or Utrecht is. And how did you convince them? With the data or did you No, no, you must, argument? no, arguments, yes. Argument. You must make, uh, you must write a plan. Okay. So, uh, and that's, this is our plan. Our plan was to uh, communicate with the community to do at six weeks uh, contact and to use with the whole team the 4, uh, 4D model. But what I what Uli asked is to uh, I think we are very good at GPs in Netherlands, but we are not good to um, to be also seen in the in the wijk. You must go also in the wijk because they be, they need us. Thank you. There's uh, there are two two inputs from the online audience. The first one. Thank you so much for the excellent presentations. Um, regarding Brazil's agents and the England CHWs, the improvement in heart health outcomes or intermediate variables is hugely impressive in both settings. Apparently, the case for cost effectiveness has been accepted in Brazil, but unfortunately for funders such as health insurers in Netherlands um, or aid organizations in Kenya, cost and cost benefit analysis is often the only language they understand. Is health economics research being done or planned? Mm. Um, so, shall I, shall I answer so, that? Uh, sure, you can hear a bit about that. No, I, I can just, I mean, I think Majid showed cost benefits, right? Yeah. Um, I think there's a little bit more data on that, to be honest. Um, do you know? They said per patient, they think that this, the cost effect is uh, minus 305, uh, 365 euros in a year time. So we, they know that you have its cost uh, to give only more money, which is better for the health insurance. Yeah, so I think they, they did a calculation in the Netherlands. Yeah. yeah, like 356 euros per patient, which would be a decrease in costs of half a million a year. On yearly basis. Yeah. Thank you. This, this microphone is better. Um, Shakib wants to share a few stories if it's allowed. You, maybe Shakib, you can share one story about another region. Is that okay? You're still online? Oh, it's not. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm online. Can we hear oh, yeah, and it's not not stories, but uh, actually oh, something. Oh, sorry, you might not have One second. Yeah, actually, it's not. Yeah, it's not a story, but I would. I just want to say that in other regions there is also such programs are uh, are um, f financed from the S three segment. Uh, I think it's not. Uh, it's, it's familiar for a lot of GPs here, uh, and also uh, thanks to the Integrale Zorg Accord, which we have there. There are a lot of transition money also for this program, and it can also be used. And because I work in three regions, in all those regions, there's, it is possible to make uh, to make some um, uh, 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 yeah to make some deals with the uh, with insurance company. Um, so this is actually not nowadays. It's not you have you don't have to beg it anymore, but you can um, you can show them the results, and they are much more open for this suggestion to uh, finance the krachtige basis zorg. All for example, well and Obrecept. There's also some other regions they are working the same way. It, 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 I think it's very important to see that the, the, the freedom, the freedom that you get, that you get, get the password is very important. We, you get uh, from the insurers, you get uh, some money and you are free to spend it on the way. You are free to spend it on your own opinion. So it's very important to get the, also the trust from the insurers that you can spend it where you can, where the best is from the community. Very true, but I think one essential thing, especially in Holland, is true, is that you have good project plans. It, only with good project plans and the data in it, you can convince them. And you should somehow take the effort to make these project plans. That's quite essential. You agree, Matthias? Actually, Barbara Starfield 
she was the one who on basis of her evidence showed the Brazil government to have these Casa de Salud, these houses of health with one doctor, one nurse and community workers in the whole of Brazil. And that works and that still works, you see. And by that powerful lady, Barbara Stafford, was quite impressive. Okay. From Connie. Online, Connie says, in Westminster, we financed this via the public health grant initially. Now it is financed via the NHS funds. Um, and there is an argument it should come from the national public health allocation of the health budget. Public health spending is four times more effective than NHS spending. Well, Having a CHWW for every household in England would cost two billion, which is small fry for the health budget. It was an ad from Connie. Okay, well, can you imagine that the whole of Holland healthcare is going to change towards this totally different preventive approach? It would be a huge paradigm shift. Um, and uh, somehow, I think these speakers tonight have contributed to this total change of mind that's actually happening now, but very slowly and maybe much too slow. We're going to see what's going to happen. I hope that everybody online has enjoyed these, these, these fantastic presentations, which were, the content was so powerful and it went so fast. And these damned English, they speak so fast that it is sometimes difficult to get it. But I hope you got it. And uh, I want to thank Fleur and Majid and Shaggy and Connie for their fantastic presentations. And it was, it was a great evening. I enjoyed it a whole lot. I promised everybody that I would stop at 9.30 sharp. And that's going to happen so that you can relieve and have a coffee now and think it over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah, well, well. The presents will be sent to the speakers that are online and the ones that are sitting here, they get it now.